Hey, this is Mr. Spencer, and we're giving a summary and analysis of the short story, A Perfect Day for Banana Fish. All right, so stick with me. A Perfect Day for Banana Fish. Originally, the story was published in 1948, right after World War II. Are you studying World War II in your U.S. history class? It was incredibly violent, maybe the most violent war of all time, at least up to that point. He included it in a larger book of short stories. There were nine of them. He just called the book Nine Short Stories. But he first gave the public a chance to read this bizarre little story in the New Yorker magazine. Okay, so he published it in this New Yorker magazine in the wintertime, January 31st. Just like right now, you see the snow on the ground on that magazine cover? It was the first story to include a member of the Glass family, and it was the story that would permanently change his standing in the literary community. Okay, he's the author of our next book, so that's just we're getting a sense of this writer's style and this writer's philosophy before we read our next book, The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Okay, let's look at the short story. Okay, there's a character named Seymour Glass. Okay, now Seymour Glass is a veteran. He served in the army in World War II. We don't find that out until about two or three pages in, but there's tiny little hints and breadcrumbs that are dropped along the way. For you to pay attention to okay in my other video i already went over reading the story it's seven pages long okay this is just a summary to help you break it down he has trouble adjusting to civilian life after the war readjusting to what it means to live normally go out to eat go to the beach do you remember all these things before the pandemic and it's an understandable problem that thousands of soldiers faced you might learn about that in your u.s history class we find out most of the information about Seymour through the phone conversation on the first two pages between his wife, Muriel, and Muriel's mother at the beginning of the story. The mother's very nervous about Muriel being away and being alone with Seymour. She doesn't trust him. She is appalled and disgusted that he was released by the army hospital. And she recounts a few of his actions that let the reader know he is suffering from what we know today as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is similar to what happened to J.D. Salinger, the author himself. He also was in the Army Hospital, and he also served in the military in World War II. He stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. But that's the author. Let's just focus on the fictional character, okay? A summary of these main characters in the story. PTSD, okay? The mother, Muriel's mother, is distressed that Muriel allowed Seymour to drive the car. The mother asked, did he try any of that funny business with the trees? Although this is not explained, guys, the statement alone is enough to demonstrate some concern and thought. What's this funny business with the trees? The mother also asks if Seymour has called Muriel any more names, little bad little nicknames. Don't go to Urban Dictionary, but this is something meaning a promiscuous woman. Muriel admits that Seymour recently called her Miss Spiritual Tramp of 1948 which also gives us the year the story takes place. Muriel also asks her mother if she knows where the German book of poems is that Seymour sent her. This established that Seymour did serve in Europe, and he was probably in Germany in World War II, instead of with some other Americans in Japan, right? U.S. history class. Muriel tells her mother that there is a psychiatrist who's at the hotel who she has spoken to, which is another allusion and reference to Seymour's issues. Okay, more on that later. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Do you understand? This is the subtext of the story. The most significant reference is to Seymour's tattoo. Did you notice this little hint to a tattoo? Muriel's on the phone with her mother. She says that Seymour lays on the beach in his bathrobe, and he won't take it off because he doesn't want people to see his tattoo. I don't have one, but look at that picture. Her mother asks if he got it when he was in the army, but Muriel changes the subject. Political prisoners were in German concentration camps in World War II. They were tattooed with a serial number. This may be what Seymour had on his arm. Today, tattoos are very common, but in the 1940s, most people who got tattoos were of a lower socioeconomic level. Poor people, rough people. Is Seymour rough? Muriel, let's summarize this main character. She appears through the first pages of the story. She then fades from the story. She's only in the first half. Her role is to provide the reader with Seymour's story. This is an indirect way to tell us about Seymour Glass. She represents the upper middle class wife who waited for her husband to come home from the war to resume her life. Her actions are shallow. They indicate vanity. 
She's very full of herself. She paints her nails. She reads a magazine. She washed her comb. <laughs> do you do that? She tweezed her hairs from her mole and moved buttons on her blouse around. She's very particular, upper class and rich. She represents the materialism of post-war America. The boomers. Okay, boomer. She shops at Saks Fifth Avenue, a super expensive clothing store in New York. She's wearing a silk robe. Silk? Oh, man, that's expensive. It covers up her sunburn. And she's very condescending, looking down on people, condescending about the people at the hotel, implying that they are not of her upper social class. Got it? And then who's this other character? Sybil. All right. By the second half of the story, we've met Sybil. Seymour Glass, she says, who was staying at the hotel with her mother. Did you see more glass? See more glass. That's a verbal pun. Sybil is introduced as soon as Muriel hangs up with her mother. The transition is startling and abrupt. It's weird. It's bizarre in the story, the way it's told. Sybil's mother's putting suntan lotion on her shoulders. And back when Sybil asked her mother this question, Sybil's mother doesn't understand the reference to Seymour, Seymour Glass, the character. And she sends her daughter to the beach. The author, J.D. Salinger, he clues us into Sybil's youth and innocence with this strange description. Okay, it says, Sybil was sitting insecurely on a huge inflated beach ball facing the ocean. She was wearing a canary yellow two-piece bathing suit, one piece of which she would not actually be needing for another nine or ten years. Why would she not need one piece of her bathing suit for nine or ten more years? You got to think about that. Don't think too hard, though. Okay, the wing-like blades on her back in the description is meant to give an impression of maybe an angel. A canary yellow two-piece bathing suit, nine or ten more years, she won't need one piece of it. That's to let us know that Sybil is at most maybe five years old, meaning she would not need the top of her bikini until puberty hits. She won't need the top half of her bikini. Sybil, mother, she goes to the bar with a friend for a martini, and Sybil's set free to explore the beach. She runs off to find Seymour Glass, spelled differently, but is she looking for the character Seymour? Based on their conversation, it's clear that this is not their first meeting. Sybil knows Muriel, calling her the lady, and Seymour says that he was waiting for Sybil before going into the water. So, okay, yellow and blue are important colors in this story. Notice, Seymour admires Sybil's blue bathing suit, but she corrects him and says, no, actually it's a yellow, but she brushes it off as maybe Seymour just making a silly joke. The color blue in literature it can often symbolize sadness, depth, like the ocean, or maybe innocence, okay? When you see the color blue in literature, sometimes it represents deepness or depth like the ocean. It could represent sadness, and some people think it represents innocence, okay? The darker the blue, though, sometimes the darker the theme attached to it. Sybil's bathing suit may literally be yellow, but Seymour can... See more? Can see more? See more? Do you understand? Does he perceive Sybil's essential innocence? Seymour's own bathing suit is royal blue, it says, and Muriel's coat, from which she had the padding taken out, maybe to appear younger or smaller, is also blue. As the padding is taken out, that implies that Muriel is less innocent. Okay, that's Seymour's wife. Seymour and Sybil, remember, she's like five years old. They swim in the blue Atlantic Ocean. So what could the colors mean? You might put that on your symbolism chart for the next assignment. Who's the Sharon Lipschitz? She's just referenced and heard about. Sybil mentions this other little girl, Sharon Lipschitz, in a way that portrays jealousy. He let you sit on the piano seat with her. Sharon Lipschitz said that. Sybil nodded vigorously. Seymour responds by saying he pretended that Cheryl was Sybil. This does give the reader a creepy feeling. The mood becomes a little odd. That Seymour's focus on the child, is it perverted? Could he be a pedophile? We are supposed to wonder this. The tone of the story shifts to dread and fear for the child, but finish reading the end of the story. There's more to the story than just this oversimplification. What's up with Seymour? And then Sybil, the name, this little girl. Well, the name represents the Sybils who were female prophets. They could see the future in Greek and Roman mythology. Their prophecies in Greek mythology, which emerged as riddles, were interpreted by priests. The quote on the previous slide might show that, okay, 
Maybe Sybil bargained with God, Apollo offering her virginity for years of life, totaling as many grains of sand as she could hold in her hand. You might look that up in Greek mythology. However, she reneged or went back on the deal, and he allowed her, God, to wither away over the span of her near mortality as she forgot to ask for eternal youth. As the Sybil grew older, she shrank in size, finally becoming so small, she lived in a bottle. When the boy asked Sybil what she wanted, she would reply that she wished only to die. This Greek mythological allusion and reference to death might serve as foreshadowing for what is to come. Okay. If you look this up, you might find some more details about the choice of her name. Sybil, from Greek and Roman mythology. But let's go back to banana fish. All right, here's my slides. Banana fish are imaginary creatures in the story. They serve as a metaphor, similar to the Cumaean Sybil. They gorge themselves on bananas, they get stuck in a hole, and then they die of banana fever. This concept, metaphorically, of greed, self-obsession, harkens back to the original scene with Muriel. Muriel's obsession with her appearance keeps her in her room, painting her nails, fixing her clothes. She's focused on appearances, Seymour's wife. She even broaches the topic of dyeing her hair mink, which at the time was an allusion to a fur mink coat. Seymour isolates himself from his wife Muriel in the story by staying on the beach away from her focus on appearances and materialism. He spends his time with a child, maybe representing innocence, Sybil on the beach, which causes both a sense of foreboding, we're scared, and a question as to why an adult male would want to socialize with a four or five year old child. So as we wonder that, let's think about this going for a swim. Is there any symbolism in this? Seymour takes Sybil out on the float, and as the water gets deeper, he holds Sybil by the ankle. She claims to see a banana fish near the end of the story with six bananas in its mouth, and he replies by kissing her foot. This could be a reference, though, to Christian and the Bible's narrative about Jesus, a theological reference to foot washing. Okay, many religions have foot washing as sort of a ritualistic behavior. Jesus in the Bible washed the feet of his disciples on the night of the Last Supper before he was taken to the cross and crucified. The Last Supper... The sinning woman washed Jesus' feet with her tears, and that helped her gain absolution, absolved herself of sins. She was able to give up any sinful nature that she had by washing Jesus' feet with her tears. Could the author be using this reference to the Bible? In the banana fish story, soon after this moment, okay, Sybil kisses, or Seymour kisses Sybil's feet. He brings Sybil back to the beach and says goodbye. Is that his goodbye, does he know what he's about to do on the last page of the story? This is the last we see of Sybil, and we realize that Seymour's intentions were not perverted. He's not a pedophile. Instead, he is seeking some sort of cleanse, some sort of absolution. Okay. What happened in the war? Why did he say some banana fish can eat as many as 78 bananas? Did Seymour shoot 78 people in the war? Did he kill 78 Nazis in Europe? What happened to Seymour? What sins is he trying to absolve? So there's certainly some motifs and themes that sort of work against each other in this story. Nature versus society. The author, J.D. Salinger, he juxtaposes and contrasts the concept of proper behavior in society, the wildness of nature, and how it's impossible to control your nature. When Seymour and Sybil are out in the ocean, a wave crashes close to them, making Sybil nervous. Seymour responds with a line that would function perfectly well in polite society. We'll ignore it. We'll snub it. We won't even pay attention to it. With this line, he effectively turns the societal graces that would make him functional in his mother-in-law's eyes, Muriel's mother, into total nonsense. He's employing them against a force of nature that can be neither snubbed nor ignored. He can't ignore his nature. Did he have a violent nature? What happened in the war? In doing so, Seymour points out the ridiculous of snubbing itself and the society that allows it. You can't just condescend, brush that dirt off, and act like other people don't matter. 
Life does matter. People do matter. And what about that elevator on the last page of the story? After leaving Sybil, Seymour goes back to the hotel. He gets in the elevator with a woman he doesn't know, and he accuses her of looking at his feet. She claims she's staring at the floor, and Seymour yells at her. The woman quickly exit, exits the elevator, and Seymour fumes. He says, I have two normal feet, and I can't see the slightest gosh darn reason why anybody should stare at them. Is this woman's rejection of his statement about his feet a rejection of a plea for absolution? Based on his next move, it appears that Seymour does not feel as if he belongs in this world any longer. The last scene, he goes into the hotel room he shares with his wife, Muriel, removes a handgun. It's an Ortigi's caliber 765 automatic. Now, I've never used this gun, but it was a German gun. It was manufactured in the early 1920s, and it could very well be a gun that Seymour picked up during the war. Is either a souvenir, or maybe it's from a Nazi that he killed. He shoots himself through the head at the last paragraph of the story. The sun. It gives life, but it also burns. Muriel, in the story, locked away in the hotel room. She got a bad sunburn, even though she used suntan lotion. She lives life to the fullest, but you're going to get burned. Sybil's mother puts suntan lotion on her to ensure she doesn't burn, and she doesn't, implying maybe she hasn't begun to live life yet. Sybil's too young to be burned by adulthood. And the woman in the elevator, she wears zinc oxide on her nose, it says on the last page of the story, indicating that she's nosy about other people's lives. Keep your nose out of my business. Seymour is incredibly pale. He wears a bathrobe, which implies his life maybe no longer being lived. Has he given up on life? He's a ghost of his former self. He's no longer of this world. Okay. What do you think the sun symbolizes? What do you think the sunburn could symbolize in the story? Does life burn us? Does adulthood ultimately burn us, metaphorically? And what's up with, did he kill himself? Why? What's with this banana fish? Remember, banana fish gorge themselves until they die. So you could interpret Seymour's actions as having maybe gorged on the violence of war, and he can't get it out of his mind. He's consumed by the memories of war. His connection to the girl Sybil is maybe his attempt to connect innocence to youthful incorruptibility. Kids can't be corrupted. They're so young and innocent. But is that a fantasy? Even Sybil herself demonstrates the adult emotions of jealousy and lying. Most of the play-by-play -play is sort of jealousy and lying that she's playing with with the Sharon Lipschitz episode. And the fact that he never appears in a scene with Muriel indicates his alienation from his wife. He no longer feels bonded to his wife, Muriel. He feels isolated from everyone. He doesn't care about the post-war materialism and spending money and the boomers or the desire to get on with one's life. He's given up. What do you think? Remember, these are just my interpretations. Do you have an alternate theory about the banana fish or the sunburn? Okay. Like an argumentative essay, don't use I believe or I think. Just state your arguments clearly, confidently, and persuasively. I've studied lots around the context of this story, but you are ultimately the one that needs to come up with your own interpretation of the story. Our next assignment will ask you to analyze symbolism, think outside the box, and take some risks in your interpretation. What are you going to write there? This is Mr. Spencer signing off.